Get the home field advantage every time with Fairfield by Marriott, official hotel partner of the NCAA. Whether you're a student athlete working toward your championship dreams or your team's biggest fan, Fairfield by Marriott has everything you need to get ready for game day. From comfortable guest rooms to complimentary hot breakfast, Fairfield is part of the Marriott Bonvoy portfolio of hotels and official hotel partner of the NCAA. Visit fairfield.marriott.com to book your next game day stay. At Granger, we're for the ones who specialize in saving the day and for the ones who've mastered the art of keeping business moving. We offer industrial-grade supplies for every industry with same-day pickup and next-day delivery on most orders all backed by real people ready to help. So you can get the right answers and products right when you need them. Call, click Granger.com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. Welcome into The Verge, a show which covers the Baltimore Orioles minor leagues. The Verge is part of BSL Radio. Baltimore Sports and Life is dedicated to analysis and discussion on the Orioles, Baltimore Ravens, and the University of Maryland. The site has a team of writers providing coverage of those teams and houses live streaming content weekly. Join the conversations at the message board, like BSL on Facebook, and follow BSL on Twitter. On Twitter. Want to make a podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere and even earn money, all in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer, so no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. Ever since we discovered Spotify for Podcasters, we feel like having options like video podcasts and Q&A lets us be more creative on another level. I highly recommend you give it a try. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com slash podcasters to get started. Welcome to the latest on the Birds Major League Mailbag. This is Zach Spedden. Recording here on Saturday, July 29th to take the latest questions from members of our Patreon community as well as some of our listeners who follow us on social media. We are just days away from the trade deadline, so a lot of this episode is going to focus on the trade deadline. But we have some other questions as well about some prospect-related issues, perhaps some things the Orioles could focus on this offseason. And at the end, a teaser that some for something that we have in the works for our listeners that we think is going to be pretty fun. We'll start off with this question from Tony B. Realistically, how far do you see the O's going this year? Not just get into the playoffs and anything can happen. I would say that a realistic expectation, given the way the Orioles are playing right now and what may or may not happen to trade deadline, is one series win in the postseason. So if they get in as a wild card team, I could see them winning the wild card round, getting to the division series. If they manage to hold on to this league leading the American League East, and they do get in as either the first or second best team in the American League and go right to the division series, I could see them winning the division series. I don't see this as a year where they get to the World Series just because they're a young team. And this is you know the natural progression that we have seen other teams go through. Look at the Cubs in 2015, the Astros that same year. You could even... They're not a perfect parallel, but you can even look at a team like the 2007 Phillies where you had guys like Cole Hamels, Ryan Howard, really getting established at the major league level. And the next year, they went back to the playoffs after winning the NL East again and won the World Series after being eliminated in the division series the year before. So that's the path that I kind of see the Orioles going on. And I don't know that there's going to be a lot that happens as a trade deadline to significantly change that. The real key, and this is going to be something we're going to talk about later on, is making sure that your pitchers are fresh or as fresh as they can be going into the playoffs. And then the other side of that is the lineup. Uh, I don't expect the Orioles to add to their offense at the trade deadline, and they really don't need to because the lineup as it is now is solid, and you have some reinforcements down at AAA who could help this team out. You know, take someone like Heston Kerstad. And even if he doesn't play every day when he comes up, if he can be the bat off the bench or the guy who gets 
a start here and there, lower in the order against a right-handed pitcher, that could help you. However, what we do see with this lineup sometimes is a tendency for guys to go cold. So the real question is going to be when you get into the playoffs, do you have Gunnar Henderson and Adley Rutzman both going at the same time? What does Austin Hayes look like at that point? Is Cedric Mullins healthy? So it's not all about the pitching, but the pitching is going to be a big X factor, X factor in how far they can go if when they get to the playoffs. We'll go to this question now from Paul Jones, a member of our Patreon community. Paul says, just listen to the Between the Numbers pod, which was great. With some of the younger starters getting ready to throw the most pitches they have ever had at the big league level, does it that make it more important to be aggressive for arms at the deadline? And just give a little bit of background here. Santiago, a member of our Patreon community, has done a couple of uh, podcasts now called Between the Numbers, where he looks at some of the dives a little bit deeper into the data. He's done an episode on Dean Kramer. His most recent episode was on pitcher fatigue. Highly recommend that. He's done an excellent job on those shows. Going back to Paul's question, though, I would say that it does make it more important. And there's a couple of approaches the Orioles could take to address this issue at the deadline. The obvious one is to go out and get an established starter who doesn't have the same fatigue concerns. And while the starting pitching market We've already seen a couple of names pulled off. Sohei Otani's not going to be traded. Lucas Giolito has already been dealt. Lance Lynn has already been traded. While the starting pitching market is sort of quickly evolving, there are enough arms there between the rentals and the players with a year or two of team control left that the Orioles could get someone who could at least stabilize the rotation down the stretch. The other approach could be to... Stick with the starters that you have now, but bolster the middle of the bullpen so that you're not having to have your starters go as deep in the games. This could be particularly helpful for guys like Kyle Bradis, Tyler Wells, Dean Kramer, and even Grayson Rodriguez as you get closer to the postseason, knowing that if they only go five innings, you can get the rest, you know, you can get through the rest of the game on your bullpen. Right now, with the Orioles bullpen being the way it is, I don't feel like you can be confident to do that. So Improving the middle relief corps could be a way to sort of mitigate some of the concerns about the rotation and at the same time improve an area of need for this roster. Looking at those two approaches, I think that a blend of the two might be the best solution. Maybe you go out and you find a team that has a starter and a reliever available right now and you make a deal and you get two players back in one trade. Or you look for a middle reliever or two that you can get for a reasonable price, and then you add a starter. But I don't think a one or the other solution is necessarily going to be the best thing because we just don't know how long into the season Grayson Rodriguez and Tyler Wells can go. Kyle Bradis, you know, his last start in Philadelphia was not very good, but he'd been excellent for over a month up to that point. How far realistically can he go into the season? So there's, you got to kind of look at those two things. And I think the safest route is to improve the rotation and the bullpen at the same time. But those are two separate approaches that the Orioles could take. Along those same lines, Ben wants to know, if the Orioles add another pitcher at the deadline, who gets moved off the 26-man roster? How about if they add two? So what this is going to probably come down to, depending on who the Orioles acquire, is going to be options remaining. Sinel Perez and Danny Coulomb do not have options remaining. Coulomb wouldn't go anywhere anyways in this scenario. Perez has really struggled this year, but the only way that I would see him being DFA'd at the deadline or around the deadline is if the Orioles pick up another left-hander. Because I don't know that they're going to be willing to have a situation where the only left-handers in your bullpen are Cole Irvin, who's going to be more of a long and middle relief guy, and I think could actually be effective in that role, but not necessarily a late inning guy. And then Colomb, who is your late inning guy. There's really nothing there in the middle. And Perez can kind of fill that void, even if his outings are shaky to this point. So if they don't add a left-hander, then my suspicion is that Michael Ballman or Brian Baker are sent down to Norfolk. Ballman has been fairly effective for the Orioles this year, and I think he's been valuable in some instances because he is a reliever that can give you more than three outs if you need him to but he does have options left he's a younger guy or at least a guy who doesn't have a lot of major league time so you could send him back to Norfolk for a little bit 
just as an easier way to manage his innings and look to get him back up later on. Baker is a little bit different situation. Uh, the issue that he has had this year is, one, he's walking more guys than he did last year, and he also has not been good at keeping inherited runners on base. So that could be something that goes against him. He does have two options remaining per um, roster resource over at Fangraphs. So that could be another factor where you send him down, it wouldn't necessarily be that you're sending him down for the rest of the year. But you could send him down to get a little bit of rest, work on some things, and look to bring him back up later on. To get back to Perez, um, the better, you know, the more pressing issue for him uh, might be John Means and D.L. Hall. And we do have a question about those two guys, so I'll go into more detail on that in a moment. But if the Orioles don't pick up a left-hander at the deadline and they keep Perez in the bullpen, that does buy him time to turn things around. But if he doesn't turn things around and the Orioles feel like D.L. Hall or John Means could be better in the role that Perez is in, that could be when they move on from him. Speaking of Means and Hall, Bobby Jones asks, just how do they fit back in? Assuming bullpen, but how many innings can be expected? On Friday, Mike Elias met with the media, and during that scrum, he gave an update on both Means and Hall. It's looking like Means will have a rehab, his first rehab outing in the FCL in early August. I would expect that that means we probably see him in late August, early September. I'm looking for a gradual buildup, and if everything goes through without a hitch, which is not a guarantee in rehab processes, but if he's able to get through, have clean outings, and he feels good, We probably see him late August, early September, and I would expect that it is going to be in a bullpen role. As for Hall, he had an an outing on Tuesday in the FCL. Elias gave an update on that, and I'm quoting here from Rich Dubroth over at BaltimoreBaseball.com about what Hall's role could be going forward, because Elias seemed to leave the door open for multiple possibilities when he said, quote, we're going to keep building and eventually get him out of Florida. I think the interesting part of the decision with D.L. Hall will be whether to build him all the way back up to four plus innings like we would with a starting pitcher or possibly see fit to truncate that, get him up and running as a relief option for the stretch. So clearly the decision has not been made on Hall where the Orioles are not going to save the decision on Hall publicly right now. With that said, it just feels like with everything the Hall has been through this year, and for what the Orioles' needs are, that building him back up as a short outing reliever makes the most sense. So let's say he's able to get in and he gives you 10 innings down the stretch, 10 innings in the months of September out of the bullpen, but those 10 innings are really valuable because he's a left-hander who can throw hard. Part of the reason he's in the FCL now is to build his velocity back up. He's reportedly touching the mid-90s again. So if his velocity looks good, and his secondaries are just good enough to get through an inning or two at a time. Building him back up as a reliever, I think, makes the most sense. Does that close the door on him as a starter forever? It doesn't have to. I still don't know that he's going to stick in the rotation, but it doesn't have to close the door on him as a starter forever. But knowing that you have limited time left this season, if you feel that he's a guy that can contribute at the major league level, Going for those short-term outings makes sense, especially because you have Cole Irvin and John Means who can fill the void and maybe give you a little bit longer outings. Irvin certainly can. And Means, depending on how he builds back up, maybe you feel like he can go more than an inning or two at a time. We'll have to see once he gets back on the mound, but those are probably the courses for D.L. Hall and John Means at this point. We'll continue to discuss on pitching, but Look ahead and talk about a player that the Orioles have already acquired. As Tony wants to know, will Fuji re-sign? And that's a very good question. When the Orioles acquired Centauro Fujinami from the A's in exchange for Easton Lucas, it was sort of analyzed as the Orioles pick up a rental because Fujinami will be a free agent after this season. And obviously, it's no guarantee that he's going to be back. So you should look at him right now as a rental. That said, there is a scenario where I think it would make sense for both sides to re-up for 2024. For Fujinami, it's that the Orioles pitching program could be a good fit for him, especially because he already comes in with that fastball-splitter combination. If they feel like they can hone that and really take him to the next level after this season, then he could decide to come back on a one-year deal, 
hope to have a lights out 2024 season and leverage that into a bigger contract in free agency next year. For the Orioles, it could be that Fujinami stands out as a really good insurance policy in case Yenier Cano regresses or Felix Bautista even regresses a little bit. And it gives you a pitcher who you're familiar with, who fits your mold in a lot of ways, that can come in and be another high leverage late inning option for you. Where that scenario would probably fall apart is either if Fujinami really struggles down the stretch and the Orioles realize that they, you know, kind of got what they could from him and that he's not the best fit for them going forward, or he's so good over the final weeks of the regular season or the final months of the regular season and in the playoffs that another team is willing to really give him a generous two- or three-year contract. So that remains to be seen, but there is a scenario where I think it would make sense for both sides to re-sign, and I don't think it's an implausible one either. We'll mix things up with this question from Sterling. Who wants to know if, when MLB expands, what would be the best division for the Orioles to be in teams-wise? If MLB does expand, which I think is going to happen at some point, you know, maybe later this decade, you're probably looking at two 16-team leagues with four 14 divisions. So the other three teams that are in the Orioles division would ideally be similar mid to small market clubs. So that's probably a division with the Orioles... Guardians, Tigers, and then your fourth team could be the Rays, which would be kind of an outlier geographically. Or if Nashville gets an expansion team, that could be where they end up. Now, there's not really an easy way. The easy way to do it would probably be to scrap the American League and National League format, decide to go with Eastern and Western Leagues, which would mean you could have a division that has Baltimore, Pittsburgh, Washington, and Philadelphia in it. And then you could have the Rays, Marlins, and Braves in the South Division, maybe with Nashville. That could be something you look at. I just don't know that I see MLB going there. So my ideal with what could be realistic would be that Cleveland and Detroit are two of the other opponents in that division. Hopefully then you have Toronto, New York, and Boston, who are always probably going to be able to spend a lot more, or going to be able or willing to spend a lot more than the Orioles are. And just operate in different markets, larger markets. They're out of there. You know, they're in their own division. The Orioles are in a division with similar markets where they're able to probably compete on a more regular basis or compete on more even footing. That would be my ideal, but it's anyone's guess how expansion is going to play out. David Adams has a question about my personal background and something that I shared on our most recent episode of On the Verge, which was that. I was a videographer in the Nationals farm system, specifically with the Low A Hager Sound Suns, for five seasons. And he wants to know, now that you've shared that you were a videographer in Low A for, for the Nationals for five years, can you please tell us your experience and give us three of the best stories from your days doing that? So I was the videographer with the Hager Sound Suns from 2008 to 2012 and had the fortune to work with a lot of great people in the Nationals player development staff during that time. Frankly, way too many in the name without leaving somebody out in the span of this segment. And it was also a fun time to be in that organization to see it really take off from that span. Because that's really when the Nationals player development system started to churn out great prospect after great prospect. That eventually led to a really good stretch at the major league level from 2012 to 2019. As for some of the fondest memories that I'll have, um, one that will always stand out is getting to see the Suns clinch a playoff spot at home in 2012. Uh, it was good for me personally because I grew up in Hagerstown, had been going to Suns games my whole life, and Hagerstown up to that point had not been to the playoffs in seven years, and in that span between playoff appearances had just one winning season. So to see them get back into the postseason was memorable, but for that group of guys to do it was made it even better because that 2012 Hager Sound Suns, some of the best people that you'll ever be around among the players and coaches from that group. I uh, always really enjoyed that team. The year before that, in 2011, Steven Strasburg and Ryan Zerman came for rehab assignments, and that filled the place up to the point where I know for Strasburg's first start and when Zimmerman came through, 
it was so crowded in that ballpark that people bought general admission tickets and actually sat on the steps in the aisle just to see these guys play. And Strasburg, one thing I'll always remember, and he gave up a home run in his first start um, with Hagerstown. And nationally, it was sort of covered as like, oh, LOL, Strasburg gave up a home run in a rehab assignment to this catcher who I've never heard of before. And I remember thinking, because I had seen this guy play a few times, like, that catcher is pretty good. And it turned out that it was JT Realmuto, who obviously has gone on to have a great career. But I remember it's like, in the moment, it was sort of treated as like this humorous anecdote that Strasburg gave up a home run to a catcher who was not at that point a household name among prospects. And the guy has gone on to have an excellent major league career. Um, Speaking of the Marlins, one other memory I will always have is seeing Jose Fernandez pits at Municipal Stadium. And what stands out from that day is I remember getting there. And and when you sometimes when bad weather is coming in uh, before a game starts, there's a lot of people who have to have their hands in that decision. It's both managers. It's the general manager of the team. It's the umpires. So there's a lot of factors you're looking at. I remember there was a lot of conversation, a lot of like looking at the radar. And this game, because Hagerstown and Greensboro were competing for the first half title, had playoff implications. So it was important to get the game in. From the looks of the radar, it looked like they had maybe at least a 90-minute window, perhaps even up to two hours, which meant you could get a full game in. You could avoid the doubleheader tomorrow, keep things going. So game barely gets started, and all of a sudden a pop-up storm that was not on the radar rolls in and hits. Then Fernandez goes out and takes the mound in the bottom of the first inning, and he's throwing an easy 95-98. to It just looked effortless. You could hear the pop of the ball going into the glove, and... It was not crowded there that night, and it had emptied out even more once the rain started. So Municipal Stadium was so small that you could actually hear conversations on the field when it was not crowded. So Fernandez would throw a pitch, and then he'd put his arms up in the air, and he would gesture down to the mound, because the mound at this point is wet. And he's wanting the grounds crew to come out and treat it, which they had already done. And he would throw another pitch, do the same thing. And then you heard the home plate umpire say to him, get back on the mound, or something to that effect. Like, we're not doing this. And I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was something to that effect. And sure enough, despite whatever issues he was having with the mound, he just was blowing away Hager Sound's hitters. And I remember watching him and, and just kind of being in awe of it, honestly, because it just looked so effortless. And to this day, I don't know if the mound was actually bothering him that much, or if it was a way to play mind games with the hitters, because he had this stuff that was hard to pick up in clear weather, uh, much less in pouring down rain. And this is a way to just throw the hitters off even more. I'm going to take this extra time between pitches when I'm in the middle of blowing them away. Unfortunately, because of the rain, the game would get suspended. So I only saw Fernandez throw, I think, either an inning plus or two full innings before the rain came in. But That was a performance that, although short, I'll always remember. Now that we've had that trip down memory lane, I'll go back to the Orioles now. And this question from at Felix Pies Burner on Twitter. How much time in new position do you think someone needs in the minors before we're comfortable calling them up? Thinking Heston at first or Mayo slash Norby in the outfield. I tend to not put a number on it just because I know that every player in every position is different. So, for instance, you're... Curve for Kerstad learning first base is probably shorter than Norby or Mayo adjusting to the outfield, not just because of the demands of the position, but because we know that there's various things that they have to adjust to when they get to the major leagues. I mean, we're seeing it right now with Colton Kowser. We saw it with Kyle Stowers and even Cedric Mullins a few years ago, where playing the outfield in the major leagues is just different than it is in the minor leagues. And while there's not a lot you can do at AAA to prepare for things like adjusting to three-level ballparks, getting used to the way that certain outfields are configured, you can still, you know, have the practice of at least getting your routes to the ball down. Certain things like that where you need the time to put into it. So I don't really look at it in terms of a fixed number for each player, but 
look more so at the demands of the position they're trying to learn and what their past background is too. You know, have they had experience at that position before at the high school or college levels? If so, how long has it been? So I would say just kind of take that holistic approach where rather than look at a specific amount of games or a specific amount of innings or attempts, look more at what position the player is trying to adjust to, how much experience, if any, they've had at that position before, and make that your criteria. And, you know, it's also worth pointing out that if you have a player trying to learn left field, the configuration, or even center field for that matter, the configuration of the Camden Yards, which is not something you can easily recreate at any of the Orioles affiliates, is something else you have to figure out. So you really need to see how much ground can the guy cover and how can they adjust to playing in different dimensions before you feel like you can roll them out in left field at Camden Yards. We'll go to this question from Sterling now, who wants to know, who wins Rookie of the Year next year? Jackson Holiday or Heston Kerstad? Both would have a reasonable shot. Don't rule out Kobe Mayo either. So I think the Orioles have three pretty strong candidates. Holiday will have the advantage of having the hype. But then Kerstad has that card-carrying tool with his power where you feel like if he comes in and he leads rookies in home runs, let's say, um, that could put him a long way towards winning Rookie of the Year. So right now, if I had to guess, I might lean Kerstad just because he's closer to the major leagues. He has that certain tool with the power. And I also feel like Kerstad is definitely going to be in the major leagues on opening day next year. Whereas with Holiday, it's going to depend how much time does he get in Norfolk. Do the Orioles feel like he's ready to be in the major leagues from day one next year? Time will tell, but right now, I lean Kerstad, but... Definitely would not rule out Holiday and definitely do not discount Kobe Mayo at all. David Adams wants previews of the Orioles' upcoming series against the Toronto Blue Jays and the New York Mets. The Orioles will head to Toronto on Monday to begin a four-game set at Rogers Center before coming home over the weekend to take on the Mets. Starting with Toronto, the Orioles are slated to draw Chris Bassett in Monday's opener before Hyun Jin Ryu takes the ball for the Blue Jays on Tuesday. Ryu has not pitched in the Major League since June of last year when he underwent Tommy John surgery, so it will be interesting to see how he looks in his first start back. From there, you say Kikuchi will take the ball from the Blue Jays on Wednesday before the Orioles face off against old friend Kevin Gosman in Thursday's finale. The Orioles have played Toronto pretty well this year. They're 5-1 and one in the season series, and that includes a sweep at Rogers Center earlier this year. The Orioles have played the Blues A's well so far this year, going 5-1 and one in the season series, which includes a sweep earlier this year at Rogers Center. Toronto, though, hanging around in a playoff race. They currently are in the playoff picture as a wildcard team, and they sit 5.5 back in the division with a 58-46 and 46 record. A series win would be great for the Orioles here because it would allow them to pull further ahead in the season series against Toronto and then also possibly knock them further back in the American League East standings and get one team that's beyond Tampa Bay to fall further down, which would really help the Orioles a lot. As for the Mets series, we don't have probable starters yet. But even if we did, it probably wouldn't mean a whole lot because the Mets might look a little bit different after the trade deadline. After winning 101 games in 2022, the Mets were big spenders in the offseason with Justin Verlander being their headline acquisition in hopes of making a run at the World Series. That has not worked out for them. They currently sit, as I'm recording this, at 49-54, and fourth place in the National League East, with, according to baseball reference, just a 3.9% chance to make the postseason. There is a possibility that they could deal from the Major League roster even more as they seem to be in seller's mode after trading David Robertson to the Miami Marlins. Will Justin Verlander and Max Serger still be with the Mets next weekend when they come to town? We don't know. That all remains to be seen. But the Mets clearly in a different direction than going in a different direction than what many saw them going in prior to this season. Now, what is, of course, interesting to wonder is could we see a trade between the Orioles and the Mets? in the coming days. Uh, Just because the Mets have really emptied out their farm system in the last few years, and even to get someone towards the bottom of the Orioles' top 30 or top 35 would help them out a lot. 
Verlander and Scherzer are the names that I'm sure a lot of people would love to see the Orioles target just because they do fit in. They have that veteran postseason experience. Both guys are going to be Hall of Famers. But they could also look at the Mets' bullpen to see if there are some names there that could be of interest. For instance, Adam Adovino. Uh, I wonder, would the Orioles be interested in him? He is signed through this year, has a player option for next year. His numbers this season have been pretty solid. So just something to keep an eye on is, could the Orioles and Mets match up in a trade between now and and when the Mets come into town next weekend. We'll wrap up this edition in the mailbag with a question from Sterling, who wants to know when is the next On the Birds Hangout. We are working on something right now and hope to have it announced very, very soon. It's not at the point where we can go public with it just yet, but I will say that we are working on something, and hopefully here in the next couple of weeks, we'll be able to announce plans on air for a live show in the next few months. Uh, We had a live show at Full Tilt Brewing last year. We had a lot of fun with that. We're hoping to recreate that experience somewhere else here in the coming months. We're close on something. Can't announce it just yet, but you're definitely gonna wanna get ready for a live show in Baltimore, not too far from Candom Yards. I will drop that hint in there, which is that we are working on something. The venue is not gonna be too far from the ballpark. We really hope that our listeners can make it to that one. It should be a good time, and we will announce the details as soon as we can. But I can definitely tell you we are working on something, and it should be a lot of fun once it comes to fruition. And that does it for this edition of the Major League Mailbag. Thank you, as always, to members of our Patreon community, our followers on social media, and the people who who listen to our show for sending in the questions. Uh, As always, great questions. Bob, Nick, and I will be back on the air Monday night with a preview of the trade deadline. We'll discuss what moves the Orioles have made up to that point, what moves they could make before the deadline, maybe talk about a little bit what's going on around baseball as a whole, and of course have some minor league news for you in there as well. In the meantime, thank you for listening to this MLB Mailbag. That'll do it for this week's episode of On The Verge. Be sure to check out our Patreon page where you can help show your support for the show and get bonus content, including monthly top 50 updates to our prospect list and daily game recaps during the season and much, much more. For the ones who get it done, the most important part is the one you need now. And the best partner is the one who can deliver. That's why millions of maintenance and repair pros trust Granger Because we have professional-grade supplies for every industry, even hard-to-find products. And we have same-day pickup and next-day delivery on most orders. But most importantly, we have an unwavering commitment to help keep you up and running. Call, clickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done.